Okay, just let me know by saying I'm in the Word. Once again, it's the book of Mark, chapter number 9. And we'll start at verse number 19. And I will read your hearing. And I'm certain that uh, those who are not in the Word yet, you will certainly catch up. This will be Mark, once again, the book of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 19. And I'll start at verse number 29. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wild foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Amen. Maybe see. Now, let me give you a little bit of background um, on this. We find out that uh, the scribes in, uh, are questioning the disciples before this point. Uh, there had been a young man uh, who was had a dumb spirit. And one of the multitude asked him, as Jesus comes, uh, he had been away from his disciples, and as he comes now back to them, he asked the scribes, why are you reasoning? What are you saying? What are you, why are you dealing with my disciples? And one of the multitude came and said, Master, this is this very father. He comes and says, my son has a dumb spirit. In other words, he cannot speak. And not only that, but Whenever the, the, the spirit takes him and tears him, and he foams at the mouth, and he gnashes the teeth. But on top of that, I spoke to your disciples, and they could not cast him out. I asked your disciples to, to deal with this, to heal him, because I know that they have a reputation for healing. Jesus had already given them a mandate to heal the sick, and also to cast out demons. So they had two mandates at this point. And when we look at this, Jesus now responds in verse number 19. We're in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse starting at 19. Jesus now responds to this situation, not just the scribes, but he says, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. Now, what do you see here as Jesus responds to now exactly what's going on? Because Jesus responds here, and his words are clear. He says, O oh, faithless generation. Now, he does not make a, dis a distinction between Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, uh, or disciples. He says the whole generation is faithless. Now, there have been other points where Jesus has said, O oh, ye of little faith. But not here. He does not say little faith. He says zero faith. Because faithless is no faith. And he says, you faithless generation, how long must I be with you? What do you say? Anybody? What, what's, what's Jesus saying to the disciples? Because he says, how long must I be with you? And then he says, how long must I suffer you? But how can the disciples be faithless if they are following Christ? If they have the power that they, uh, that they had from before this particular scripture, and there is no indication that this has been taken back from them, how then does Jesus now count them in the number of the faithless? Thank you. Based off of uh, them not being able to cast out this demon, he could tell by their inability to cast out this demon that they weren't using the faith that they should have to be able to cast him out. And when he then said... No, wait a minute. You said they're not using. Right. Are they not using it? Or do they not have it? Because Jesus doesn't say, you guys aren't using your tools. He says... You are a faithless, being without faith generation. They don't have the faith. They don't have the faith. Go ahead. What are you going to say? All right. So, and, 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 and their 
And this was di uh, directly relating to now what their inability to do, because they had no ability to cast out this demon, it was uh, in direct correlation to their lack of faith or their, their no faith in this situation to do those things that they're powered to do because, you know, without faith, how can you please God? And if you don't have faith, we can now walk in those, those powers that's given to us by God. Now, how can they, let me ask you this, how do they walk and or move or call a faithless generation? Are we saying they have no faith? Because, I mean, are they followers of Christ? Right. Yes. Uh, they, have they cast out demons before this? Yes. Have they left Christ? No. So then how then does Jesus look at them and call them faithless? But you had your hand up. Until they see for themselves, they were not, it was like they had eyes and couldn't see and ears and couldn't hear. Amen. Just Robert. And maybe it could have been that um, sometimes your faith could falter, like it goes sort of up and down, maybe in different trials or challenges that you deal with. And maybe at this particular time, maybe their faith had, had faltered. Well, as you look at this, doesn't Jesus say, though, you're faithless? He doesn't say their faith is even faltered. He says that actually they're operating in a place where they they really aren't, don't have a lifestyle of faith. They're actually operating in gifts without faith. And what they didn't realize was that for a period of time, you can actually operate in gifts without actually having faith. It is the power of God. So they were coming up against demons that would tremble at the very name of Jesus. What they didn't realize was that it wasn't always stay that way. That they recognized that they're simply because they used Jesus' name, because they, they had the power where Jesus says, you can do this. They simply were able to do it simply because it was already commanded by God. But a lifestyle is required to operate past the gifting. So what they didn't know was I don't have a lifestyle of gifts. I have to develop a lifestyle of faith. And they were developing a dependence upon the gifts of God. And what they didn't realize is why he says faith is generation is that to whom much is given, much is required. When a person is given much and they operate like everybody else, Jesus literally accounts that to zero faith. Because look what he says. How long do I have to be with you? Haven't I proven this to you already? Haven't I given you direct examples already? Haven't I operated in directly in your face? How long do I have to be with you? In other words, what else am I supposed to do in order for you to believe? Now it's just obstinance. Now it's just rebellion. He's now talking to the disciples and saying, you all are just rebelling now. This is the inability to believe me. This is a fact that you aren't actually applying faith to what I'm saying. You're not listening to me. That's why he says, how long must I be with you? So they didn't realize that their faithlessness was in direct opposition to Jesus' ministry. They were as much opposed to his ministry as the, as the Pharisees were. Why? Look at the reputation. Look, look, at, look at what this does. Jesus is not looking now at the disciples and saying, look what you're doing in my kingdom. No, no, he says, look what your faithlessness is doing. There's a man who came to you with an issue that you were supposed to be able to handle and you couldn't do it. And what it has done, it is now destroying the faith of this man. So faithlessness has the ability to destroy faith in other people. Mm. This is why this is so powerful. Because he says, for you all not to do it, it's literally akin to being faithless. When the people of God who are given to know the mysteries of the kingdom operate like regular folks who've never seen, that's worse. He literally places in a place of faithlessness. Now, and Jesus literally rebukes them here, but now look what he says. He says, um, how long must I suffer you? Bring him to me. 
So now, the shifting of the weight from the disciples has now shifted to Christ. And now, Christ says, and they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tore him, he fell on the ground and wobbled foaming. And then Jesus asked his father, how long ago has it been since he came, since this came unto him? And he said, since he was a child. Now, what do you see here? Because you can see now the hatred and the opposition of this demonic spirit. But why does he do this? When Jesus walks up, the demonic spirit begins to tear at the boy. When as soon as he saw him, straightway the spirit tore him, he fell on the ground, and he began wallowing, foaming. What's going on? What's happening here? Let me ask you this. Is the power of God operating right now? Is he worse than he was just a minute ago? Was he wallowing and foaming a minute ago? Was he gnashing a minute ago? But now that Jesus is coming to the place, why is it worse than it was just a minute ago? I thought that was supposed to make it better. Because the presence of God is not supposed to make me better. It is supposed to make me worse. It's supposed to make me better. Yet, is this boy better or is he worse? The boy does look worse. But he's not going to stay that way. He's not going to stay that way. But what's happening with the demon? The demon recognizes the presence of Christ. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And what is the demon now doing? Holding on. In anticipation of being, cast of being cast out. The demon now recognizes, because this is oftentimes what happens when power enters the room. It may get worse before it gets better. Yes. And it may look worse before it gets better. And one of the things that's required here, why Christ requires faith, is that the man has to still believe God when it looks worse and does not even know. But the spirit world, the demon now, is going to be doing as much damage as he can for one reason. I'm about to be kicked out of this body in no time. I've got to do my worst in these few moments. So there's only a moment more of pain and deliverance is about to happen. This is the regular sickness. This is absolute demonic possession and affliction. And it shows us that the moment that the soul and the spirit of man are, is about to change, affliction multiplies. Mm. Yes. Look at it. Look at that, exactly what happened. Now the demon is responding and we're looking and saying, maybe the people of God, you know, oftentimes when the people of God start praying, things get worse and we stop. And we don't realize that cancer, diabetes, whatever we're coming up against is actually flaring up simply because the demon is anticipating being cast out. But we look at the prognosis and say, oh wow, so what happened on the test? They said you have it and it's spreading. And the moment we hear that, we change our prayer. We stop praying for deliverance and start asking God to give them a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, give them the strength to handle it. And God is like, I sent you in to conquer this demon, and here you are asking me to help them to get through it with a certain amount of joy. And we miss now this power, because Jesus doesn't stop because it gets worse. Now, but look at the question he asked him. He says, how long ago has this come over him? Uh, uh, how long is it ago since this came unto him? This kind of demonic spirit. How long has this kind come unto him? Because we, I want you to hold that because you notice later, Jesus says, this kind only goes out by fasting and praying. So now Jesus is now literally identifying the demon. Now, what does this tell you? Why does the Messiah, why, how is it possible that Jesus, the, 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 the Son of God, why is he asking questions here? Does he know everything here? What's the point here of asking questions? Yes. For the benefit of the disciples. It is for the benefit of the disciples, but is it also for the benefit of this man? Yes. Tell, tell me the benefit. Because he's getting him to look at the whole picture and the situation. And it's like, before I bring you out, let me show you the process so you can understand how you got to this place so you'll recognize what you're being delivered from. Yes, that's also there. 
Now, does it also tell us about spiritual warfare? And that spiritual warfare is much more than oil and the waving of hands. That in truth, there are certain type of demonic powers. See, that's why we're not powerful. Because the things that the gifts that God gives us, we love staying right there. And we honestly believe that we will be able to tackle demons by that one empowerment, that one anointing where we just lay hands, we point to things, we use the gifts of discernment, we prophesy, and we think that's power in the kingdom. Yet Christ shows himself that in order to really operate, there is another level of spiritual warfare that has to be understood, and that is we have to have an intimate knowledge of the spirit realm. We have to know what even demonic forces we're coming up against. Jesus said, I need to know how deeply entrenched this problem is in your family. Before, as a physician, before I tell you what you need to do, I'm not just going to come up here and throw some oil around and, and start speaking in tongues or laying on of hands. I need to know because I know this is a different type of demon that isn't going to respond to standard cures. If we are in a box, we will find ourselves never seeing the miracles that God has promised us. We'll never operate in the power that God has promised us because we like one trick pony stuff. We like, okay, well, God, you know, he touched me and I felt it and I think that's all there is. And God says, no, you have to study to show yourself approved. You want to understand the demonic powers that you're operating against? You have to get past just the gospel and you have to get into the letters to understand we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You got to understand there's a hierarchy in spiritual powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, the principalities, rulers of darkness. We got to understand Standings. There are different types of demons that we come up against, and they all simply don't bow down at the very name of Jesus. Believe it or not, he says demons tremble at his name. You will notice that he didn't say all of them. He never said all of them. And we're going to come up against one right now that is not trembling. But we see another one in Mark chapter 5 that when Jesus comes up against this demon, he says, um... Jesus, that son of David, have you come to cast us out before the time? Jesus says, what's your name? He says, we are legion because we are many. This demon doesn't just roll over. And when Jesus says, leave him, he says, don't cast us into the abyss. Cast us into these swine over here. So they didn't just stop. And they didn't just triple. Matter of fact, they used his name. So that means that if we're going to understand higher levels of spiritual warfare we've got to study at a higher level, we've got to seek God at a higher level, and our lifestyles are important to our power. Questions? Comments? Alright, so Jesus says how long has he been this way? And the man responds in verse 22, he says well let me tell you about what happens, he says oftentimes we, you know, that this demon will cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. That's the devil's job, right? To kill, steal, and destroy. And then he says, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, what do you see here? What do you see here in this man? What do you see here in his um, response to Christ's question? Christ says, how long has it been this way? He says, it's been this way all my life. And all his life. No, 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 not all my life. All his life. It's been this way since he was a child. This demon has possessed him since he was a child. And we have been living with this demonically possessed child from his very time of entering into this earth. What do you see? What do you see in his response? Desperation and no faith. You do see desperation. I don't know. Do you not see faith? Yes. Well, because remember, don't you see up here in verse number 17 where he says, I have brought unto thee my son. So now he has to have some faith, right? He has faith in Jesus, but he, well, I guess he would have to understand the power of faith and he's not there. But he has faith, right? He has faith in Christ, yes. Okay. Just go Day one, so he's been dealing with this for such a long, long time. So 
So it's like a battle, I guess. It's a, it's a huge battle. It, look, I mean, look what he says. He says, have compassion on us and help us. He, he's not talking about this being something that just happened to this child. He's saying, listen, this is destroying our whole life. This is destroying the life, not just mine, my wife, our, his brother. This demon doesn't just affect one person in the family. This demonic oppression can affect the whole family can change the whole generation. But, he says, if I can do anything, have compassion on us. What do you think about what he said? Um, he's saying if you can do anything because he recognized the fact that they initially took the boy to disciples and they couldn't do anything. That's right. So he's saying, they couldn't do nothing, but if you can do something, that's right. do something. That's right. What do you think about that? What do you, what do you think about that statement? It's a certain it's a certainly an indictment on the disciples. But is it not also an indictment against Christ? Yeah. Because isn't the if right. essential here to understand? Yes. That's him trying to mix faith and doubt together. And you can't mm -hmm. mix them both together. The if is saying like that's a doubting word. Absolutely. You can't do it. So not only is he doubting Christ right now, but he's also holding on to the doubt that he had for the disciples. But yes. You can do it. You can't mix it together. Well, he has doubt with the disciples. He has doubt with Jesus because his first doesn't even count now everything that has happened. Yes. Here is the reason for my doubt. You've got to be able to understand this. Right. Does Jesus understand this? Sure. You sure? Because Jesus doesn't seem to respond like a person that says, hey, I understand where you're going. Where you're going. Well, doesn't he say, if you can do anything? And Jesus says, well, if you can believe. Right. So in essence, here's what the man does. He says, here is my burden. I'm going to shift this burden to Jesus. Jesus says, no, you are not. I'm going to shift this burden right back to you. Now, I thought we're supposed to cast our cares upon him. So now, why does Jesus now say, you are not going to shift this burden on me. I'm going to send this burden right back to you. So you want to know if I can do anything? Is that what you're saying? Let me tell you what I want to know. If you can believe, then impossibility won't stay as a dominant factor in your life. Impossibilities are running you. You have limits in your life and ceilings all around you simply because of your unbelief. And now with your unbelief, you want to take your unbelief and your situation, not even believe in me, and you want me to do something, and you want to start your prayer with, if you can, and you think I'm going to answer that. Mm. Without faith, it's impossible to please me. But here's what God is doing. Christ is simply saying, I can't help you until you have faith. So I need to increase your faith. So one of the things that Christ does now is he simply says, the burden now is shifted back to him because he has the power to overcome this. This is your battle and you can win. First thing. I think that's why in verse 21 when Christ said, like, how long does it go since this came unto him? Not only is he saying how long has this boy been in this situation, but also how long have you been in that mindset? That's right. How long are you putting up with this? And listen, in essence, doesn't Christ say, how long have you been letting this devil live in your house? How long have you been letting this devil just take over your child? I mean, how long have you been sitting back here with the white flag up waving with the power of faith in you? But, you, but So I'm not going to do it. I'm going to now empower you and let you know if you now do what you're supposed to do. God, aren't you winning? You want to deliver me. When you act like a person who wants to be delivered. All right. I'm not just doing stuff to just do stuff. And you can't just ask me stuff and not even believe I can do it and just expect magic. I'm God, not a magician. And there was dramatic difference. Because he says to this man, he says, well, let me shift it back to you. Here's a challenge. If you can believe yourself, all things. Now, what's this all things? Everything that is promised to you as a believer 
it's actually, you can actually have it if you can actually believe. What do you think about that? Yes, Sister Ward? In actuality, I'm thinking I can do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens me. That's right. That's right. Now, it, what it does is it takes us to the place of having to question then why don't we, why aren't we able to do all things? And is the problem with Christ's ability to strengthen us? No. Is that the issue? Yeah, the, we limit our own selves. Yes. We're confined by our own ideas about who Christ is and, and what he is to us. And because we limit ourselves, we can't see the fullness of Christ. Well, let me ask you this. Is there a problem with them seeing the fullness of Christ? Not the fullness of Christ, but the power. Is it Christ, though? That's the issue here. It's how, they see it's how they see themselves. They saw Christ. Didn't he already confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of the living God? Didn't Jesus say, flesh and blood, and I reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven? How do you see Christ? It's not really the issue. You can see the full glory of Christ and bow down before him all day long and know he's awesome and mighty. But if you never know you're fearfully and wonderfully made, if you never know you're the head and not the tail, you can live like the tail and worship Christ and praise him like crazy. Amen. You can live below your means. You will never know you're part of a royal priesthood. You'll never understand the truth of the matter is that you're supposed to have a joy that's unspeakable and go crazy for Jesus and miss the job that Jesus did in transforming us. The job of Christ was not, you know what, look at me be transformed. No, the issue was, if I die and resurrected, you can be resurrected too. So if you miss your transformation, you all you know is Jesus, but you don't know the power of God because he's found in what he's done in you. So to say that Jesus descended from heaven, that's great. The devil can still beat you up with that little bit of revelation. But if you don't know, if you know he lives in you, and you and him, that changes everything. That changes everything. So there is where the disciples now were in a limited place. And now this man is in a very limited place. But he does say something interesting. The father cries out and he says with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, isn't this a contrast? Like, I mean, can this be? I mean, grammatically, I guess it works, but theoretically, can this work? I believe, but I don't believe. Or does he say that? He says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Now, what is he saying? And does he have faith? And is a miracle happening in 24 that is not happening anywhere else yet? Did he? He's saying that I believe in you, but I don't believe in that my situation here will change. Okay. I'll take that. Well, so what's happening here when he says this? Because of his lack of belief and understanding that his situation can change, he's asking Christ to help him even in that area. That his son can be healed of this demon that he's being possessed by. Now, let me ask you this. Does he ask a question about the demonic possession, though? No. Does he key him on the faith issue? Does this man have faith? Yes, sir. Yes, D? Yes, he has faith, but he believes he doesn't have enough. Isn't that the place where God wanted him to be? Right. Isn't this the place? You now can have it. Wow, it's open. The ignorance is gone. You can't even... People who don't have faith are absolutely unconscious of their unbelief. But when you have faith, what it does, it makes you hyper-conscious of your unbelief. So now he's wide open to receive. Matter of fact, at this point, he has a faith increase because of what he says. If somebody had something that you want, and they said, it's going to cost you $20, and you have only $10, if you walk away and go try to find $10, that's normal, right? What happens if you said to that person, I only have ten dollars. Can you give me the other ten? Then would you get off thinking that you can ask that person who has what you need? 
the other half. But why would he now come and say, Christ, I do have faith, but I lack some faith. Make up the difference for me. Mm. Where would you get this revelation had it not now been a faith increase just in his asking, help my unbelief? Only a friend of God would dare come boldly before the throne asking what he will. Mm -hmm. This was the moment of change right here. What an awesome faith increase that Christ uses with this little bit of faith. And the moment he asked, it was given to him instantly. He doesn't wait for it. He gets a faith increase instantly. I do believe. And matter of fact, I believe you can help me in my area of unbelief. There is no greater faith than that right there. You can. And you're a reward of those who diligently seek. So that means that while my child is going through this, why is Jesus not fixing my situation? How come Jesus ain't like, taking care? Because he came with the boy. So now the boy's foaming and carrying on. What's Jesus doing? He's talking to the Father. Aren't there situations in your life where you're looking and saying, I don't want to talk about getting greater faith. Can't you see what's going on right here? Yeah. I don't need another Bible study. Please don't send me more scriptures. Listen, help me with this thing I have going on right here. And God says, listen, that's how we're going to fix that thing right there. All right. I'm not trying to fix that. I'm trying to fix you. I need to start a lifestyle, not a situation. Jesus was forming a life in this man, not a moment. He was going to take this home and teach this child about faith. So that means you've got to have some experiences that build your faith in order for you to be able to impart it to anybody else. We like to have it, but if we just got it without any trials, without any change, without any transformation, we couldn't possibly be good to anybody else. So, he cries out. He says, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus sees the people coming together. Uh, and he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and ripped him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead. Matter of fact, in so much as that they thought he was dead. Now, What's going on here in verse 26? At the presence of Jesus, the demon begins to cause the boy to tremble and to foam and to gnash. So he has a seizure, even at the very presence of God. Now that Jesus has spoken to this demon, this demon doesn't leave right away. What's going on here? And this is Christ. What's happening here right now? And, and what, what do you think about the diagnosis? The father says, um, my son has a dumb spirit. Verse number 17. Look at what Jesus says. He rebukes him. He says, he rebuked the foul spirit. And he says, thou dumb and deaf spirit, come out of him. And I charge thee that you enter into him no more. What do you see there? What do you see there in spiritual warfare here that oftentimes is missed? Do you see how Jesus directed this demon? Not only does he call him out, but so you, so you see, first of all, he correctly identifies the spirit. Now, I thought you were going to say that there was more than one. Well, there was definitely more than one. As you can see that Jesus now correctly identifies. Because oftentimes, don't we misidentify what's going on with us? And, and this man said, listen, I've been dealing with this since he was a child. I know better than anybody. I know what's going on. Jesus says, you don't really understand what's going on. You were dealing with a symptom. The root of this was really his, the death spirit. Because what was going on with the ear was controlling his mouth. But you didn't really realize that. So you were misdiagnosing him all this time. So oftentimes you can deal with spiritual things. And we think we're smart enough and with enough experience to diagnose them correctly. But they have to be diagnosed by Christ. They have to be dealt with now in the spirit. And if we don't have a good spirit of discernment, if we don't understand spiritual things, we can easily treat spiritual things incorrectly. And so Jesus now identifies the spirit, but look what he does. He takes authority over the spirit. He says, I charge you, come out of him. And he says, 
and I'm going to shut the door so he'll never have to deal with this spirit again. Now, it doesn't say he won't deal with any demonic spirit, but this one is under the authority of Christ. Do you know how many times we cast out demons and just dance around like the demons ain't gonna, they're just going somewhere? And we don't realize why people go back and forth over the same stuff over and over again because the door wasn't closed. And we wonder why they're going through but it's worse this time. Jesus said, listen, if the demon goes out and he comes back and the house is not clean, I mean, he finds this house swept clean. That means everything's gone. That means every defense is gone. That means all the power is gone. So if the house is just clean and there's no defenses, no, nothing has moved in. In other words, casting out a demon but not filling it with something leaves an empty space. And the demon sees the empty space. And he brings seven more demons with him that were worse than the last one. So Jesus is now educating the disciples on spiritual warfare that what they thought they knew about demonic powers because they had healed a couple headaches was not all there is to know. Questions? Yes? Uh -huh. visiting the sick or whatever and you sort of, sometimes you really like walk into a situation where you're really dealing with some demonic stuff but you, that's just, right. you don't really know that's what you're going to get when you all go to the door that's right. but once you're in the door and you begin talking to the people, then you be like oh, this is where I am this is what I'm getting ready to deal with that's right. and it's tough because sometimes you don't quite I mean, it's so you're just so not expecting it you're just not expecting what has happened really be to you. Sure. When you're dealing with that. Sure. Now, let me ask you this. Would that, could you use that with the disciples? Because look at the lifestyle that Jesus was now forming for them. They had already cast out demons. So if they then got to a point, so for instance, if you saw it once, twice, three times, if you should get to a point where you don't expect it after your experience, then what would that say? And isn't Jesus saying, how then can, how long must I suffer you? How long do I have to be here? How many houses have you walked into where you didn't expect it and you saw demonic activity? If that happens to you once, twice, three times, I want you now to expect it. I've given you a glimpse into the spiritual realm and you know that which masquerades as sickness actually can be demonic. You know that attitude is really not just a bad day. There can be a demonic spirit that's attached. So he did give them a pass in the beginning but after being with them so long, he does it. Yeah, and I will also say that I, re I recall recently when we went out to serve communion, um, we were interrupted. Like uh -huh. we were in prayer, but this spirit literally interrupted the prayer. That's right. Prayer that's right. It's real. I mean, this is this is real. And that's what Jesus really said. There were great victories. They had never encountered a spirit that didn't just move because they said move. And they now didn't understand what was going on. So Jesus sees the people running together and he casts out the spirit, but the spirit cries, he rips the man's sore, and he literally likes he is going to be dead. This obstinate, rebellious spirit is in this man. This is not a common demon. This is what legion looks like. Because every time you see legion, you will see this very same obstinate, rebellious spirit that rips at the victim, even Try to hold on and do as much damage. Don't know that it, that, that literally being cast out is imminent. Still does do as much damage before they leave. And so Jesus takes. Now look what happens. They think that the boy is dead, and but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. What do you see? And anything that you want to comment on. But what what do you see here? Because this was temporary damage, but it wasn't permanent. Well, what, what's, what's happening here? It, it, can you see a faith challenge that's happening even right now? Yes. I see a faith challenge in the fact that after um, I see a faith challenge in verse 26 where the spirit is, is crying and rending him sore and then it says it came out of him. But the next verse goes on to say that people started to say uh -huh. that the man was dead. Yes. So I see that as a big challenge in the fact that even after the demon has left, 
he's still trying to get people to spread the word or noise the word about that the man is dead as if the demon had done something permanent to him. Absolutely. But look, at, but look what happened. Doesn't the boy look dead? Yes, he does. And is it really the, is it really the demon dealing with the people? Or is the demon now dealing with the father? I don't want you to believe it, it, it's, supposed to be after the it's after the deliverance. So Jesus cannot possibly have succeeded in the deliverance if the boy is dead. What do you see Jesus doing, and what does that tell you? What sometimes it takes after deliverance. Doesn't Jesus now have to have a good grip on him and lift him up? Yeah. Doesn't that tell us what we have to do oftentimes after deliverance? After people get delivered, we kind of think, you know, well, listen, they're done. That's it. We pray. They're free. No. Oftentimes, people are at their weakest after deliverance. And Jesus now comes and he gets a firm grip on him and lifts him up. After deliverance, oftentimes, people can't lift themselves up. Even the change in this young man's life came through Christ. He couldn't do it on his own. Any questions? Come to you. Yes. This makes me think about the importance of staying connected with people. That's right. Yes, you can bring them to the altar and they can have an awesome deliverance. But what about the follow through? What That's about right. building a relationship with the person to say to make sure that they they stay in that they stay that way? Because oftentimes people get delivered and they leave, they never come That's back, right. they never hear from them. And just like you said, if if it's swept clean, they're gonna come back with. They're gonna them. come back. That's right. Because. That's right. Even though you're lifted up, you're not completely healed. You know what I'm saying? It's like taking medicine. It takes time for the antibodies to take effect. So you're not completely healed. Well, wait a minute. Because look at this. Isn't this, isn't this healing complete? Well, it's complete, but the strength is, it's like, you know, when you take all the medicine, but you still kind of weak a little bit. Well, so what do you do when you lift them up? You help them walk, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't this what Christ is saying? The deliverance has happened. But how are they going to learn how to walk right? This now is where Jesus now lifts them up. And now that's the job we do. The, the power of God will handle deliverance. But the walk of the believer is handled by the believers. Support. The support, the instruction, the direction, and the strength. The strength that a baby gets does not come from the baby. And believe it or not, the strength and the stability that a baby in Christ gets does not come from heaven. It comes from us. Ephesians 4 and 11 tells us clearly that Jesus says, and I gave some, and he names the fivefold ministry, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. For this point, he says, now to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? The uplifting, the edifying of the saints. So what does Jesus do? My whole job is once the power of God has already operated, I've got to now lift you up to teach you how to walk because he's now no longer where he was. He's entered into a whole new realm spiritually. So how does he know how to do that? When did he get when, when did he get healed? Just a moment ago. How long has he been afflicted? Since he was a child. So when has he ever walked free? When has he ever been demon free? When has he ever been in a place where he was able to walk in liberty? He doesn't know anything about liberty. But whoever came from darkness has never been in light. So when they get saved on a Sunday, why in the world do we think that they just know how to do this on Monday? They're already saved. The deliverance has happened. But now the walk and the people of God have got to get a good grip on the people that are delivered and not think that they can stand up on their own. We have to be able to see them delivered and know that in order for you to get up, it's going to take all of us to pull you up with a good grip in the midst of people who can't believe it and are testifying that you're still dead. Because look at this. It is the life of the baby Christ that no people around them still say, you would look like you are dead. You look like you did before. There's nothing new about you. So once you got baptized on Saturday, you really still going through the same stuff. If we don't grab them and lift them up, they won't have the stability to walk. Questions? Excellent. Okay. So uh, 
when they had come into the house, this is a private meeting, uh, Jesus' disciples had come to him privately and they asked, they said to Jesus, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said to them, this kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Tell me what you said. He says, this kind can only come out. Now they asked the question. They, they said they asked him privately. They wanted to know that, Master, what, what happened? How come we couldn't do this? And Jesus does something. He tells them, he talks about this kind. Now what, do you, what, do you, what does he mean here? What's Jesus now talking about here? Regis and then Deacons? This type of demon or possession can only be dealt with from a consistent, from this type of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You can't be in a certain place and deal with these types of demons. You have to be connected and you have to have a certain lifestyle in order to be able to effectively deal with this type of situation. Amen. Deacons? Now, what you look at it, because it says this kind of comes out by prayer yeah, and fasting. Yeah, I mean, it took, I mean, just simple prayer was not going to be enough. That it had to take more. And the fasting, doesn't that help to strengthen you? It does strengthen you. So it's a prayer, right? Yeah, so it's a prayer, but. Now, wait a minute. Is this an indictment against prayer? Because no. he's not saying prayer is, it's going to take more than prayer, does it? And what's he talking about with them? Because don't they lack something? And, and he's saying, this kind responds to prayer and responds to fasting. This kind responds only to a committed life. This kind doesn't respond to gifts alone. This kind is not moved by people who have the gift of healing, the, 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 the gift of discernment, the gift of prophecy. This kind only moves by a person who has a committed life that's shown by fasting and praying whether there are demons around or not. They have unbelief. They're not being strengthened. He's going to say, they're not being fed. You ain't getting nothing. You're just walking around here operating in gifts, but you aren't being fed. Your faith is not being fed. The reality is you, you have unbelief. That's what he said. This kind is not going to move if people have gifts without faith. Just mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's that reveal? They don't really trust God. They don't have a full dependence on God. The disciples here are lifted up in their own strength. And they kind of think they got it going on. And yet they come up against now a problem of the kingdom they can't handle. And Christ doesn't say, well, you got to learn. No, he says, listen, you're not committed to it. Your gifts are so awesome that in front of people you look mighty. But you don't ever study. You don't ever pray. You never fast just to strengthen yourself. If you got something going on, sure, you turn your plate down because that's for something. But never for a personal connection with me. You don't pray just to, to get into the throne room to see me. You pray when stuff's happening. And that's not a committed lifestyle. So this demon knew there was, a, there was a time, I believe it is the seven sons of Siva, yeah. and the demon speaks clearly and says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, and they are both dead, and I still remember tangling with them all the time, but you, even though you got this power, I don't know you. Because I never see you in the struggles in the spirit realm. I never see you operating in the real spirit realm. Real fighters get up here and they're doing battle with the spirit realm. Daniel prayed and, and it, the angel came back and was like, your prayer is so powerful. The, the prince of Persia came and was wrestling with your prayer. That's a, I mean, that's a powerful prayer. That we, that, that my angel Michael came and said, I had to snatch the prayer from him because it was so powerful of all the prayers that were going up. A man of God in the spirit realm has a prayer that stops Satan from wherever he is and he literally goes and says, I gotta stop that because he believes in the promises of God and a man who believes in the promises of God, they must come to pass. 
And whenever we don't receive what God has promised, two things are, are, are possibilities. And one is really not. Either God is an absolute liar or we don't believe him. And the answer to the disciples was simple. You don't believe me. I need you to know that you follow me, but you don't believe me. You hear. But you don't believe me. You're not focused on my, the things that, that pertain to me. You could be right in my face and still be focused on the things that pertain to men. Questions? He says, you don't, you, don't, you don't believe me. He says, this kind can't come forth by nothing. Now, well, tell me about this kind. What do you see in this kind? Now, let me ask you this. When you see this, Christ simply says, you should have been able to cast this demon out, right? Now, do we, how many times have you ever had a situation where we pray and nothing happens and we look and say, you know what? It simply may have been God's will. How many excuses do we make for our unbelief? Where they're thinking it's supposed to happen with God, where we come back and say, it wasn't the timing of God. I prayed for the healing, but maybe they, you know, maybe God may be chastising them. Or maybe it's because of where I am right now, and God, and I don't, I don't have the power that I have. So I guess it dreams kind of up and down, depending on where I am. And these are excuses that are newly made. But there's brand new revelation that God has given as these disciples. Disciples are really getting new revelation for a new position that they're coming into. You're going to fight demons, but you won't have to know more than you know right now. You're going to fight demons, but listen, y'all going to have to start praying. The reality is it doesn't matter whether you come to Bible study, whether you come to service. If you ain't praying on Tuesday, if you don't have a life where you get into this world at all, if there's never a time that you set aside for God, you can't operate powerfully. So you will be mine and still get beat up and have black eyes in the spiritual realm, and you're supposed to be victorious. But it's because they didn't have a lifestyle that they were cultivating. How many of us have gifts? And the question is, are we cultivating our gifts? Are we adding to what God has simply said? I gave you this. You know what? Do you remember the parable of the talents? And he gives each servant a certain amount of talents. And you realize that one servant who had exactly what they started with, Christ says, you wicked servant. You unfaithful. Wow, that's faithless. And wicked servant. This person doesn't steal anything. They simply cultivate and grow nothing. And our God is a God of abundance and growth and transformation. And when we don't grow, and when we don't change and transform, that's wickedness. That's wickedness. Why? How in the world can this be wicked? I, who am I hurting? You're hurting multiple people that came to you with an issue you were supposed to handle and you could not do it. This time, I'm with you. You know what he says? How long do I have to be with you? This time I'm with you. But in 2011, I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. What's he going to do now if you can't handle this? What are they going to do now if they walk into the church and you can't do what you were called to do? What are they going to think now when they walk in here and they walk out exactly the same? Who will they indict then? The church? Not just the church. They will now point at a Christ who's not here to say, bring him to me. And he will look at us the same way he looked at the disciples and say, faithless generation. Faithless generation. You were supposed to be, you were empowered to do this. And this isn't an accident. And this isn't a weakness. And this isn't because you're going through so much. This is simply because we aren't studying to show ourselves approved unto God. We don't know the demon powers and we don't understand the power of God that has to be cultivated in us in order for us to be powerful. So we'll never get to the new level because God knows they won't be able to handle the new level. Questions? Comments here. Uh, you know what? He says this kind only goes out by fasting and prayer. What's this kind? How many, how many demon powers are there? Let me give you, I want to give you a list. And if you got notes, you can write this down. But I want to tell you, I'm going to give you these. There are 10 types of spiritual beings 
besides God. And I'll give this to you in your hearing. But, but I'm going to give you the CD if you want it as well. So you'll be able to hear it on the CD. DVD. Oh, okay. What is a seraphim? Uh, that's in Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. The other one's a cherubim. You find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Exodus chapter 1, uh, verse 5 through 28. You will also find Zoah and other living creatures, which you'll find in Revelation chapter 4. Verses 6 to 5. Uh, also Revelation 7, verse 11. Revelation 6, verse 1 through 18. These are living creatures. Um, spirit animals shaped like fleshly ones in the earth. Such as the horse, spiritual horses. You'll also find these, the chariots of fire. These uh, horses of fire in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. Uh, also 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 13 through 17. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 21. You will also find, this is your fifth one, archangels or chief angels. They rule kingdoms and planets. Michael, who is a prince. Gabriel, who stands before God. And Lucifer, who was the original ruler of the earth and also the pseudo ruler now. Your six through ten would be common angels, demons, locusts, Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. Demon horsemen, Revelation chapter 9, 12 through 21. And the very last spiritual being besides God is the inner man or the spirit man that lives inside the human being. So there are multiple spirits and the spirit realm, as you look at Revelation, and you see these various beasts that are in heaven. And there are multiple beasts that are there. These living creatures, these Zoa, that have heads of lions and eyes that go this way and that way. Some have wings. Look at the multiple spiritual beings that are created in the world. And so the disciples now are being taught, and God is starting to reveal to them there's a hierarchy in the spiritual realm. There's an organization, there's a kingdom that they're coming against. And it's going to require people who are willing to know Christ at a level greater than we know him now in order to operate powerfully in that realm. Any questions? Beautiful. Let's go them right here in prayer. Everybody good? You sure? No questions? Beautiful. So, you know, what, what the lesson is really about is developing now a lifestyle. A lifestyle. And what we find here is that the power against, in, as, as they're moving to the next level, the power was not the breathing on them and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. The what Christ is showing. Let me show you the power of a lifestyle. The gifting was limited. The power of a changed life, there was no demon that you'll ever see that can ever combat a person who lives a transformed life. Gifts can come without repentance. Gifts can be imitated. The devil cannot imitate a transformed life. That's why God says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can actually be the one who can prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That's right, so let's pray.